Hello, Uggies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. In this video, we are concluding our review of the Chameleon F3.0 uh, loop. And available for it for the first time is a very nice little uh, automatic tuner. And that's what we're going to talk about in this. The automatic tuner is put on by taking off the knob and putting the tuner in its place. And I'll show you how that's done. We're going to invert this video a little bit. I'm going to show you how it works. And then we'll show the components and how they all fit together. Right now I have the antenna on top of the filing cabinet. And I'm over here with my ICOM IC7300 and it is set to 5 watts, no, 6 watts. Okay, so definitely a QRP power level. We are also tuned on the FT8 uh, frequency. Okay, now what we have, the components that we have on the desk are the RT1 remote tuner, which has two cables, one to the SWR sensor over here and the other to the motor. We'll tune the motor. So I have not yet tuned this for this band. Um, it's actually set up for 15. So we're going to come down in frequency. Now as it turns out, this is more important than you think it might should be. You've got to decide whether to go up in frequency or down in frequency. In this case, we'll be going down. And what happens is you set it to start and then you change the frequency and this thing will uh, stop when it gets to the point where the SWR is appropriate. I've been doing some other experiments with just Morse code. But we're going to do this for FT8. Okay, so let's look over here at this. We've got this set up for FT8. We're getting our signals and so on. This is on 20 meters. Okay, so what we do is we push. We're going to go down. So we push uh, jog tune. Well, first we turn it on. Okay, jog tune. Now, having done that, I'm going to hit tune over here so that there is a signal going out and look already there we go when it turns off it's found uh, the correct frequency let's see if that's really true I'm going to press the tune again I'm going to turn on my little SWR meter here right here okay and I'm going to press tune and it says we have an SWR 1.2 okay and that's very cool. So we're tuned, we're receiving the band and everything. So we'll turn tune off. Now, this uh, then can be turned off. It's got a nine volt battery in it. Now they do supply the battery, but one of the problems with nine volt batteries is that they're expensive. And I would prefer to see that as three, even four um, double A's rather than uh, the uh, nine volt batteries just because of the cost or else something rechargeable there. This has no controls or anything to it. And one thing that is interesting that I'll point out here is that this has BNC connectors on it. Now the antenna itself the antenna that Chameleon makes has an SO239 on it to connect, and so that leaves me with PL259. Now on the back here, I put a connector, all right, so I could run a little cable with USB on each end uh, to the thing. Because my station is, is PL, or PL259 and SO239. Okay, so it works. And we see a whole bunch of signals uh, right here. Let's um, 
C just for kicks. We'll just hold on for a moment. Okay. So we're answering a CQ with that uh, antenna that's just sitting on the filing cabinet. I don't know how well we'll do, uh, but it certainly is hearing them. And let's see what happens as we come back here. It takes a little while for the um, system to lock on to a signal. He did not come back to us. He's calling CQ again. Um, that's good. We'll just try again. Again with 5 watts. That's what we're doing, just 5 watts. And this is the part down here that shows the progress of the call. And then we'll see it... Um, now the other guy, it's his turn to send a signal, and when they're done, this decode light will come on, and they're very briefly decoded everything. Not we didn't get him. Now you'll note most of these signal strength reports are negative, so uh, that's reason because we have a, a compromise antenna out there. Okay, now we are actually calling the other guy, um, and we'll see what happens. Okay, he called us. Now, it'll automatically go through a sequence. Now, he gave us a report of plus one. That's pretty cool. Okay, we're going to give him one of minus 11. These are decibels against uh, some arbitrary standard and down here you can see the progress bar there okay, he came back to us and it's going to ask us if we want to log this one and of course we do all right so we talked to somebody in uh, ke7 land all right with that antenna sitting on top of the filing cabinet. This is the basic chameleon uh, antenna right here and this is in place of the knob. Now it's mounted to a plate that normally comes around this side and you take these out and they give you screws that are slightly longer that you can put in. Now in here too when you go up, you can tune up. And as you go up, you see down in there is where there's a set screw. And they provide you with this to loosen that set screw. Is that really doing it? It's real hard to see down here. Okay, now we're going to go, we're going to continue to tune the other direction so we come up with the other set screw. Okay. I don't think I'm hitting it. This is the hard part. You've got a little tiny hole, a little itty bitty tiny hole, and way down at the bottom of the hole you can see a, a uh, the end of the set screw. Okay, we're just, you know, once you get it loose, it's loose. Let's go back to the other one. See, the problem is, I don't know if that's going down into the set screw or not. It does not feel like it is. Now, this whole thing should come apart. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret. They say, don't remove that one. Let me show you what happens if you remove it. I'm showing you this so that you don't have to do this. 
This is a way to avoid your warranty. But this pulls the cover off of this thing. And you see this little inky bitty tiny erector set style motor. And then there's a gear train in here that brings it down to basically nothing. Okay. And then if I take these screws right here and take them off. Now this thing, the hole in the middle of the mount is very tight. Even with the set screws out, Okay, the thing is you've got two set screws there and there and you need to pull them both out Not dreadfully far. You don't want to undo them But they cannot be in the way of that at all and that's how they hold on We're going to undo this set screw and then we need to turn this so that this other one is here. We turned it 90 degrees. Okay. Now, what you see down there is the shaft coming off of the gear train. Okay, and you see these things, these screws right there, those hold this uh, plastic bushing out here, and this is the mounting plate and so on. Now I just wanted to show you something about this inner part. This is the big hole and that goes on there. This is the little hole and that goes on the the end of the drive screw. Okay. Notice that the drive uh, shaft there is got it's beveled. It's got a side that's level, so uh, if you do get into that point, you'll have to push the screws in further. <clears throat> so, this piece right here, okay, normally goes right there. That allows this to be flat. If you just kind of put it down there, there's no screws for it. It'll still work. The thing is, this screw, this screw holds this level and allows this part to rotate against it so you can tune the capacitor that's inside of there. So when we put this back together, we put the little hole down here. Okay, now we need to get one of those holes lined up here so we can put our all the way in. Okay, now we need to rotate that. And then there comes the next one over into view. Now the thing about this, this is ex this is not exposed to where you can tighten this later. And if you need to tighten it, you will need to take this thing apart. So I'm just letting you know if, for example, it appears that the thing is tight but it is not turning, this is what you would take apart to fix it. And then we use that same hex key and screw this all the way in. It doesn't go into any particular place, but it does hold this very tight. Okay, now this over here, we're going to, let's do it properly. Now the new screws, you can see are longer and that's to allow it to go over this, like that. So we take one of the longer screws. 
Now they come with flat washers. One of which I've already managed to lose, so we'll put the flat washer on this one. It's a great many screwdriver twirls, and we'll just... Do we have another one? No, I forgot to take it out. That's close enough. Okay, now we will push this back just a little bit so we don't get these on the floor. This will go over this if those threads are out enough. You don't have to take them all the way out. That's very important. You just take them out so they no longer push into that center chamber. So we'll now note that I've put that notch on the top. And the reason that I've put that notch on the top, where's my other screw? There it is. Now don't use longer screws here because these will get right into the mechanism. And you don't want that to happen. There's a big capacitor in there. Now looking at the top, let's figure out where the thing is. We put one so it's right there. Okay, now we need to turn this electrically. So the other one appears. Doesn't matter which way you do it, there's only two. So if you're turning from one, you will be tuning to the other, okay? So now, there are the controls on here. Tune means turn it fast down in frequency. Tune means turn it fast up in frequency. Jog is a real quick little, just that, a jog. It barely turns. Now, two, make it go automatically to the frequency involved. You've got to push first jog and then tune. And then you apply RF. And we're tuning away from it there. Any button stops it from tuning. So we're going to do a, oh, that's right there, is jog tune. Notice that stops beeping. Well, I'm doing that. Okay, that should be back to tune. Now that's the end of the, when it starts doing that, okay, so we'll go the other way. We'll go uh, jog tune. Go the other way. We're transmitting 5 watts. I went a little bit past it. I'm manually tuning it. Let's do jog tune. Uh, for some reason, it's not finding it. Now, I've had this, well, it's right on the thing. Also, this is in a different place now. Now, we're going to press jog and tune. Now, note that it goes green. Somehow, I think it disconnects this in here, puts a dummy load in, because the signal kind of disappears while you're doing this there. Now let's see what we've got. We've got, okay, zero, refer zero reflected uh, power. So this should, again, give us a nice spectrum. And note that at 20 meters, it goes fairly wide. It's covering most of the digital part of the band, which is down over here. Okay, and we are back to FT8, and it is collecting signals. So. Let's see what we've learned from this. So, what we did. 
So one of the biggest problems with Magloop antenna is tuning it remotely. Because if you want to put any more than just, you know, five watts of power into it, uh, you've got to be sitting right next to it where you can turn the tune knob. And that actually as a use case really limits the use of these antennas. Another thing that they do here with this antenna is they'll move it. You can get up to 20 feet away from the tuning unit and the SWR meter. And I'm just going to turn that off. It is on oh, there. Um, so you can put it out on a covered uh, patio or something like that. Uh, note that they say that the actual antenna is not waterproof, so you can't just put it out in the rain like you can some others. Um, so the thing is that the thing has to be tuned. I would call this at most semi-automatic tuning. It's most helpful to remember where you were tuned. Were you tuned to the top of the band or the lower of the band? Because you have to tell this thing to tune in either one direction or the other. And the only way that you can tell that you've gone too far in the other direction is to actually hear the little motor because it's having to tune harder. And that's hard if you've got the thing outside and you're inside. Okay, so keep a note of what your last frequency was that you used. Now by semi-automatic, I say that you have to first arm this you hit the uh, jog button and then the tune for either up or down, okay? That will cause this light to flash red. I'm sorry, a steady red. Then you have to provide a signal from your transmitter. Either key down, key down while you're tuning or in the case of the FSK, by hitting the little tune button right here. As soon as this senses that there is steady RF on the coming into the antenna, it will start to tune. And it's going to tune until it finds the lowest SWR that it can. Now, when you're down on the lower bands, like 40, uh, 80, stuff like that, the bandwidth of the antenna is quite small, so it's very easy to overshoot. And that's what the jog button is for. Just a titch, a dit 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 dit, like moving it over to one side or the other. Again, you have to be transmitting while you do this. Okay, so if I were trying to get a station here, you'll see, if you look here, that there is signal down to about here on 20 meters and up to, oh, maybe here are in the pass band. So if you retune in that pass band, you'll be able to get the signal fairly well. As you go down in frequency, the width of that pass band goes down. So when you're on 80 meters, it might only be three or four kilohertz wide, okay? So in that case, you may have to jog this thing. The nice thing about the spectrum display here is you can kind of see where it's tuned, okay, by where there is noise. Okay, now one of the things to remember with a um, magnetic loop antenna like this is, or I guess officially it's a small HF loop, but commonly called a magnetic loop, uh, so I'll call it a magnetic loop. Uh, QST won't print the word magnetic loop in columns and text, uh, but it does not stop advertising from advertising mag loops. I think everybody in the world knows that this is a, a magnetic loop. That's what they're all called. What comes with the uh, automatic part here is a little... SWR sensing unit with a cable that goes over to the master unit. And then there is a cable that goes from the master unit all the way up to the uh, motor up there. Now in this case, they gave us two cables, one of which 
is actually an extension cable, okay? So you can uh, uh, lengthen that if you want, but they say not more than 20 feet. Now, um, what my overall assessment of this is that it's good because you can get the loop away from you so you can run a little more power. You can also get the loop outside where it will do more for you and uh, work a little bit better than it does on a filing cabinet. Although we, we've got an FT8 contact here to prove that it does work. Now, um, you don't need these if you use the knob. Now to use the knob and put it back the way it was, all you have to do is take the motor off. You can leave that little uh, adapter plate in place. You don't have to move that. Just put the knob back on and you can tune it. So moral of the story, don't lose this. I would recommend that you tape this with a piece of packing tape to the side of the loop tuner up there so you don't lose that and also write down in the instructions what the size is these sometimes have the size printed on the side and this one does not so we have an undefined um, tool that we can use for that it looks like about two millimeters, something in that range. But uh, I'd get one and try it, get one that's labeled. Okay, so this is what you get. Now, this little meter right here is a little uh, standalone S meter that uh, I'm actually using after the transmitter so I can see that it's actually tuned. This has no indication of tuning except that this light will stop being red uh, after it finds a tune, okay? Now, do I recommend this? There are many different types of magnetic loops out there. Now, remember they're all unity gain antennas. A $3,000 loop doesn't transmit or receive any better than a $600 loop. Okay, and you can make these yourself, by the way. The difficult part is the capacitor, uh, but you can even order those from MFJ and make your own loop. Uh, now, the F loop 3.0 comes in three types. It comes in a type with a single or a double coax loop. It also comes with the uh, rigid uh, aluminum conductors, which is the one that's up there right now. It also comes with a four-foot loop, which this one did not. They didn't send that along. They just sent the, the equipment for the first two plus the automation. So we've shown that the automation works. It's not hugely fast, uh, but it is definitely fast enough. Would I recommend this antenna? Yes, sure. It would take you a bit of time to get used to which way to tune. Um, it's automated in a different sense from the MFJ automated one. And it's definitely portable, which the MFJ is not generally uh, considered portable. Uh, the MFJ does transmit the control uh, wires. These are the control wires. And this is the coax. Okay, so this is what goes out to your antenna. MFJ does it all over the coax, but um, this works, okay? Even with this, you could be operating near the balcony door, have the door mostly closed, and your antenna outside, where it can get as close as it can to the balcony edge, and so on. One thing they don't tell you much about loops is if you roll them over so that they're horizontal, they have a nice uniform radiation pattern. Now, the thing is, though, uh, that you've got to have some sort of a mechanism to hold it that way that's strong enough that's at the balcony uh, rail or something like that. That will work, too. 
So overall, having now examined the chameleon loops from three directions, first from the ones that just have either one or two loops of coax, or second, um, the one that has the rigid loop, and now third, using the automatic components that we've got right here. Do I recommend this antenna? Uh, yes, it will work. It will work well. It's a lot of money for a unity gain antenna. Uh, so your uh, use case in this is in a place where it's difficult to string up an antenna. Now that includes parks on the air. If you're setting up for parks on the air, you're going to put a table out there and you can set this antenna right on it next to you control it yourself, or if it starts to uh, become too chilly, too warm, you can retreat to the van and then leave the antenna out on the table where it has a real nice uh, capability to get on the air. Again, a unity gain antenna. Now, mag loops are obviously compromised antennas. They're not dipoles stretched out. And in reference to a dipole, the gain of this, my experience, is my experience, is that it's about the same as a dipole. So it's a unity gain antenna. But it's obviously a compromise antenna. So what do you compromise? You compromise on bandwidth. Now, uh, that means that the tuning range, because it's very high Q antenna, so the tuning range is lower. The tuning range is is lower. As you go up in frequency, you'll be able to go a little bit around where you are and uh, pick up other contacts. As you go down in frequency, like to 80 meters, you're going to be tuned right in pretty much just on one station. Okay, so there's your compromise. You're not compromising the performance of the antenna, you're compromising its bandwidth, which is a factor of its performance. I understand that, but you'll still be able to have your QSL. So, the use case for this is somebody like me who for some reason can't put an antenna outdoors. It might be XYL re, uh, restrictions, it might be HOA restrictions or whatever, but it does work inside the house. We proved it. That antenna right there, we had an FT8 contact both ways. Um, also useful for uh, parks on the air. If you're going to do this for summits on the air, you'll want to use the lowest level version, which has the coax that makes the loop, uh, because you can coil that coax tightly and put it in the brown bag that comes with the antenna uh, and have everything in your pack or on your back or whatever that you need. There is more room in that uh, little backpack thing than you actually need for just the antenna. There could be room for your QRP rig, your key, your coax, your logbook, uh, your GPS, your um, all the different parts and pieces that you need to put in there from the rig and battery all the way to the antenna, all in that one little pack, which is very handy for summits on the air. And this type of antenna is perfect for summits on the air because you don't need radials. You don't need much space. Uh, it'll work just sitting on the ground, or if you can set it up on a rock, fine, whatever. Um, you might want to make sure that you've got something to attach to the base if you want to keep it from blowing over in a bit of a breeze. But boy, that's so much easier than trying to string a dipole on top of a very rocky summit where you are the highest thing around. And there's nothing higher that you can put up to get that dipole up in the air. Could always do it uh, if, as a vertical or something like that. Okay, so there you have it. Now, th this has been an in-depth dive into the Chameleon F-Loop. I had their P-Loop before, which they no longer manufacture, and thought it was a great antenna. I think this is a great antenna. It obviously works. Okay, and with the semi-automatic tuning, uh, you'll get to the point where it'll seem like automatic tuning. So you just have to remember the up or down. Turns out that's critical, and it turns out that uh, the system doesn't ne necessarily sense when it's got 
to the end of its tuning range. I noticed one time it did. So there you have it. If you'd like to help support this channel, the biggest thing you can do is to subscribe. The next biggest thing you can do is hit that little uh, bell so that you're notified of the new videos. And then also to go to decastlercom support and find a way that works for you to help keep this channel going. So until we next meet, 73.